It has been said everyone has to eat. But how can hospitals meet this need at a profit? Cost containment in hospital food service, an introduction, illustrates even in these difficult times that food services can deliver quantity, quality, and profits by the introduction of good business practices. Donald C. Miller, R.D., hosts this provocative half hour. Donald C. Miller, R.D., hosts Cost Containment in Hospital Food Service and Introduction. All members of food service departments can utilize the ideas presented in this important program. The following program is a continuing education presentation of the Hospital Satellite Network. As we all know, the dietary department is a very difficult department to manage. It's the only department in the hospital that is an entire business unto itself. It has assembly lines, purchasing, production, in and outpatient clinical dietetics, marketing, cash receipts, and on and on. A dietary department has 20 or 30 totally different components that affect cost containment. We could easily spend two hours on each of those components. That's why this segment is called Cost Containment in Hospital Food Service, an introduction. It's designed to get the entire management team started on the same track and going in the same direction. And maybe, just maybe one or two of the ideas will be the catalyst for bigger and better things for your department. This program is intended for the entire dietary management team, both clinical and administrative, including dietetic technicians. All members of the dietary management team can win or lose depending on the success or failure of their cost containment efforts. I'm not going to preach doom and gloom to you today and tell you why we're not going to make it because I really don't believe that to be the case. People always have to eat and they'll always need nutritional guidance. We just need to make sure that we're the professionals who provide both of these services in hospitals. This is Jay Adams, the food service director for Presbyterian Intercommunity Hospital. Presbyterian Intercommunity Hospital is a regional hospital and health center consisting of 358 beds. We, of course, provide patient food and nutritional services. In addition, we provide extensive catering services, not only to our in-house clientele, but to the community as well. This does not mean we are not innovative in our patient feeding program. For example, we have recently won a grand prize in the National Restaurant Association's Great Menus Contest for our patient menu. That's solid forward thinking. And we'll be showing many other activities of Jay's which contribute to a most successful operation here at Presbyterian Intercommunity Hospital. Let's talk about some great news and give you a little historical perspective. 1960 to about 1983 was the age of the bureaucrat. Rules and regulations prevailed during this time, and profit in healthcare was a dirty word. People played it safe. We didn't want to make waves, and innovation was a little too risky. Then came 1984, with DRGs in place in many institutions, and everything changed. Now the emphasis is learning to run a cost-efficient business. And so, we too have to learn how to run our departments in a business-like way. Remember all the great ideas you had, but couldn't sell them to your boss, or didn't even try because you knew he wouldn't be interested? Well, things have changed. From now on, innovation is in. From now on, when you come up with money-making ideas, your supervisor should be all ears. This is your chance to show everyone what you can do. This, in fact, is the most opportune time in which we've ever worked. It's important for the whole dietary management team to understand that from now on, we're managing a business. And the secret to success is to learn how to improve your financial status. Doom and gloom? No way. If your dietary managers pool their efforts 
and work as a team, you can make this cost containment business work for you instead of against you. So you know where we are historically, and you know we have a tremendous opportunity. Where should we start? This is the anatomy of a typical dietary department. The list of areas in which we need to be experts is extensive. What do we start with? Purchasing? Staffing? Maybe inventory control? Patient tray service? Menus? Personnel management? Automation? Sanitation? Safety? Think about it. The answer is, we don't start with anything on the list. We do start with a complete dietary management team attitude adjustment. Building a dietary department to the point where it should be and needs to be is very difficult work. You can't just give it a nudge here and there. You can't just bring in a few new recipes or have a few pep talks and then expect things to change significantly. We need to learn a lesson from the hotel and restaurant business and develop the service attitude. After all, we're in a 100% service industry. And if serving people bothers us, then perhaps we're in the wrong business. The service attitude says, we're gonna give the best service we can 100% of the time, whether it be breakfast, lunch, dinner, weekend meals, nutritional guidance, or whatever. You will need to train your employees to offer service with a smile. Because the service attitude is being willing to go the extra yard to make your customer happy. Doing things such as carefully placing food on a plate, offering quick and friendly service, with a smile, of course, and using special garnishes are examples of what I'm talking about. If you treat your dietary department as if it were your very own business, the service attitude will come more easily. The next component of a total attitude adjustment is commitment. The dietary management team needs to set realistic goals, then together make a total commitment to reach those goals, no matter what roadblocks get in the way, and regardless of how many hours it takes. Some of your general goals could be, one, to improve food quality, two, to improve productivity, three, to improve your financial bottom line. The good news is that once you've reached your goals, once you've turned your department around, the hardest part of the job is done because maintaining a successful department is much easier than building one. So the job does get easier, and that's the good part of the challenge that we have ahead of us. Another component of a total attitude adjustment is to avoid stinking thinking. I really like that phrase. It was used by one of the most successful companies in the world, a company involved in building success through serving others. I don't sell their products, nor do I sell their systems, but I have listened to their tapes to see what kind of magic they have. Stinking thinking says, we'll never be as good as they are. You know, our boss is a real jerk. I can't do it. I won't do it. And you can't make me do it. To be successful, the dietary management team needs to make an effort to control this type of negative thinking and to lead people to the positive aspects of their jobs. Thinking positively is part of our total attitude adjustment. The management team needs to come up with a method for keeping themselves psyched up. Maybe a weekly management team meeting where you do nothing but talk about all the terrific things that have been accomplished for that particular week. And once the management team has a positive attitude, your staff will begin to be positive as well. But with your employees, you'll need to go one step further. You need to develop an effective incentive recognition system. It doesn't have to take a lot of money. Just use your imagination. For example, try an employee of the month or employee of the quarter program. Put the winning employee's picture in a prominent place in your cafeteria. Put the winning employee's name on a permanent plaque. But no matter what the program you set up is, make it meaningful and sincere. Another factor to consider before embarking on your cost containment efforts is good communication at all levels of your department, of course. Keep people informed, and better yet, keep them involved. Let your employees have input into as many things as possible because sometimes your employees know what the answer is before you do. The food service director here at Presbyterian was having trouble with employees leaving cold drinks all over the kitchen. To help solve the problem, one of Jay's employees recommended this water fountain. It was installed, and the problem decreased significantly. 
Another very important thing to do is to make sure that you lead by example. You see, whatever vibes or intensity level that you put out, either knowingly or otherwise, will be quickly picked up by your employees. If the management team is professional and works hard, chances are your employees will do the same. Two other essentials to the total attitude adjustment are paying attention to details and getting back to the basics. Paying attention to details means, for example, making sure you gave all the appropriate accompaniments with your meals. For example, cranberry sauce with turkey, horseradish sauce with steamship round, or Parmesan cheese with spaghetti, etc. Food service is filled with details that are often overlooked. We'll need to pay attention to these details in order to be successful in the future. I've seen management teams get so involved in complicated projects and systems that they lost track of the basics. Some of the basics that I'm talking about are service, sanitation, quality control, quality food, recipes, effective job schedules, enforcing policies and procedures. We'll never outgrow these principles. In our business, with our personnel turnover, we will always be teaching and reteaching them. In fact, food service is nothing but a system composed of the basics. So let's summarize what we've been talking about up to this point. One of our primary concerns in hospital food service is cost containment. We think that in order to improve our record with regard to cost containment, the dietary management team and the dietary employees will need to make an attitude adjustment. We'll need to make a 100% commitment to a common cause. We'll need to become more service oriented. We'll need to avoid that negative thinking and emphasize the positive. We'll need to communicate better and to lead by example. And most important, we'll need to pay attention to details and get back to the basics. If someone were to ask me, what is the Achilles heel of a hospital food service department? I would have to answer the hospital cafeteria. Yet, the hospital cafeteria, if properly managed and marketed, can totally revolutionize your department's financial status, your image, your clout, your power, and the job security of everyone in the dietary department, including the clinical dietitians. Please don't misunderstand me here. The cafeteria is not the most important aspect of a dietary department by any stretch of the imagination. However, it does need our attention and fast. One of the first steps to take towards building a successful cafeteria is to find one and take a look at it. With that in mind, let's take a walk through the Presbyterian Intercommunity Hospital Cafeteria. Clinical staff, please stay with us because clinical and administrative people will need to function as a team in the future. Each will need to be familiar with what the other is doing and why. Let's take a look at the various components in this cafeteria. This is the entrance with su sufficient space for customers to enter without trampling each other to death. Turnstiles are recommended to minimize pilferage opportunities. This is the tray station with trays, flatware, and napkins. This hospital uses rounded trapezoid trays to save space and to accommodate round tables. Some facilities have increased the capacity of their seating areas by using small trapezoid trays, smaller tables, and chairs that take minimal floor space. Many facilities use plastic flatware because stainless steel flatware disappears rather quickly and because it reduces the workload of the wear washing facilities. After you pick up your utensils, you can choose between the salad bar, the soup bar, sandwiches pre-made, sandwiches made to order, or traditional hot food. In this cafeteria, people don't stand in the same line to get to all of these areas. For example, if someone is planning to have the salad bar, then they go directly to that area without waiting. This scramble supermarket type system is more effective than the old traditional one-line cafeteria system. The scramble system allows you to serve more people at the same time. This is the self-serve soup bar. It's small and not too fancy, but it does get the job done. The soup bar can include a variety of breads and crackers. And here they offer one soup of the day plus chili. They serve chili every day because they've discovered that there's a demand for it. If you know that your customers will buy something on a regular basis, there's nothing wrong with serving it every day. 
The key factor to remember about a soup bar is that it's very profitable. That is, your net food cost is normally very low. So if you're trying to improve your profit margins, then soup is a good thing to push. I used to sell soup for about a dollar per eight ounce bowl. At this hospital, they sell it by the weighed ounce. I think that selling it by the ounce is the best method. And just because soup is inexpensive doesn't mean that you have to sell it cheap. Sell it for whatever the market will bear, taking the hospital philosophy into consideration, of course. This is a two-sided build-your-own salad bar. This facility wasn't really designed to accommodate a salad bar, but they put it in anyway because their customers want it and because the more different self-serve items they offer, the more people they can serve at one time. The best method for selling salad bars is by the ounce. In order to sell by the ounce, you'll need to use disposable plates. The ounce price includes the dressing and any other accoutrements needed. In other words, everything used to make a chef's salad must be weighed at the same time. In this hospital, salad bar is sold for 15 cents per ounce to guests and 11 cents per ounce to staff. Other facilities serve it up to 18 cents per ounce for guests and 13 cents an ounce per staff. The price you charge depends on what's on the salad bar and your overall institutional philosophy. And this is just a reminder, but when you're trying to figure out the cost of operating your cafeteria, don't forget to include a portion of the expense for the management team players, secretarial, storeroom personnel, purchasing and dishroom personnel, paper products, janitorial products, etc. And don't forget to include the cost of employee benefits. A sharp operator knows that salads and vegetables need to be freshened up with a cold water rinse before offering them for sale. This is just one small example of what I mean by fresh quality product. This is Presbyterian Hospital's NutriCart. If you've run out of room in your cafeteria, then why not bring the cart to your customers via a satellite feeding system such as this NutriCart? If you need to, you could use several NutriCarts in several different locations in your facility. We're back in the hospital servery now. At this location, you can buy hot entrees, starches, vegetables, and fast foods. Folks, the food here has to be absolutely fantastic. Your customers should be very anxious to come to lunch and buy your food. And you need to give them what they want. If you don't, they won't spend enough money, often enough, for you to be financially successful. So what do your customers want? Well, in the area of hot entrees, starch, and vegetables, it has been my experience that they want great ethnic foods like Mexican, Oriental, and Italian. They want great American foods. They want meats carved to order, vegetarian entrees, natural foods, low sodium and low calorie foods, homemade foods, and freshly made accoutrements. We've learned this by trial and error. For example, people in the West really love Mexican food. I'm talking about tacos, enchiladas, tostados, chicken tortilla casserole, chili rellenos, taquitos, and their all-time favorite is taco salad. A good taco salad can be so popular that you have to serve it once a week as a special in addition to everything else you've planned for that day. In this hospital, green chili chicken casserole is a very popular item. The secret to successful Mexican food seems to be to make it from scratch, if you can. And don't forget the salsa and sour cream and even guacamole, if you can get it. The bottom line is, you've got to find out what your customers want and then give it to them as often as they'll take it. Monotony breakers are nice, but why not make every day like a monotony breaker day? I think your customers would like Mexican food once a week providing you serve a variety of other foods with it. And I think you can serve Italian food once a week. People just love it, as long as it's a high quality product. For example, let's talk about pasta for a minute. Be sure to use a high quality pasta that will not turn to glue before it's completely cooked. Then make sure the cooks handle it properly. The best procedure is to cook it in salted water until it's done, then rinse it, just a little with room temperature water, pan it up while it's still hot, add a little butter, put it in your warmer, and serve within one hour. 
Serve it with a variety of good sauces. Try a different sauce each week. Clam sauce, meat sauce, marinara sauce, vegetarian primavera sauce, or broccoli sauce. The final touch, try using fresh grated Parmesan cheese. If you've ever had fresh grated Parmesan cheese, then you'll know there's just no comparison between the fresh and the canned variety. And remember that people will pay a little more for a quality product. At this point, you may be thinking that you can't possibly pay attention to all these details. But why not? Restaurants do it. To do well in the future, we'll have to be more like restaurants. To break even or show a profit, we'll have to charge more. And to charge more, we'll have to serve quality food. Here's another example of what I mean by quality food. When most facilities serve turkey and roast beef, they carve it up in the kitchen, pan it up, hold it in the warmer, and then serve it later. It sounds OK. That procedure is very practical, quick, and easy. However, it will cause the meat to lose most of its juices prior to serving time, and it will then no longer be an exciting product. You may be thinking, but people still buy it. Yes, they do, but not as many people as you'll need to have buy it, and not for as much money as you may need to charge for it to be financially successful. As you can see, the meat is being carved to order. But that takes labor, you say. Yes, it takes an extra person, but only at lunchtime and only for about one and a half hours. So for $10 more in labor, you can serve a fantastic product. And how about hamburgers? Remember, the people that concerned themselves with developing a consistently great hamburger became multimillionaires. If you serve a good hamburger, some of your customers will eat them every day. So do whatever it takes to make sure your hamburger is really great. Beverages are one of the most profitable products that we sell. One of the beverage items is, of course, coffee. Restaurants are often evaluated by the quality of their coffee. If the coffee's bad, the restaurant must be bad, according to our customers, at least. If we're being judged by our coffee, maybe we should become coffee experts. Remember that coffee starts to break down right after it's brewed, and dirty equipment makes bad coffee. The next most important item on the beverage station is the soda dispensing machine. This is also a very high profit item. Make sure you meet your customers' demands for low calorie sodas and make sure someone tests the soda syrup mixture for appropriateness on a routine basis. Another profitable item on the beverage station is iced tea. You can make a ton of money with a high quality iced tea product. The best way is to brew it yourself. But I've been very impressed with some of the liquid concentrated iced tea mixtures on the market. And as a last resort, you can always use the iced tea dispensers. Milk can also be a hot seller, especially if you include non-fat, low-fat, and chocolate. And frozen yogurt is yet another popular product, although it does cause a few maintenance headaches. This is the cashier station. In this facility, it takes two cashiers during peak periods. Your food could be fantastic, but if you can't get your customers through the servery and cashier stand within a few minutes, then many of your customers won't come back and you'll never know what your full sales potential is. We have no choice but to use as many cashiers as it takes during peak periods. Remember that one of your non-cashier type employees could handle the cash register for an hour or so if you add that task to his or her job description. And your regular cashiers can do other tasks during slack periods if you once again work it into their job description. The key is to stay flexible and get your customers through as fast as possible. This is a typical hospital dining room. This area should be made as space efficient and comfortable as possible. You need to have the right size tables, right size chairs, and trays to maximize your seating capacity. Comfort can be enhanced by using room dividers, booths, plants, and carpet. If your dining room is too small, show your boss how much money you could make with a more efficient seating arrangement. Until then, try offering food to go. If you'd like to increase your revenue without changing your lunch business, start marketing your breakfasts, your night meals, and snack periods. Condition all of your hospital employees to stop by in the morning at your cafeteria for a freshly baked whatever and a beverage. 
condition them to stop by during the afternoon break to pick up a freshly baked chocolate chip cookie. The point is, once again, you're limited only by your imagination. The fact is, you may make enough money from selling cookies and coffee in the afternoons to pay for a new clinical dietitian or to pay for the one that they keep trying to cut. The cafeteria has the potential to carry the financial burden of your whole dietary department. Jay, do you have some closing remarks? In the five years I have been here, we have experienced a 50% increase in revenues, a 31% increase in the number of meals served, and only a 5% increase in meal costs. One major cost containment project was making a decision to close the coffee shop and open our employee cafeteria to the public. We in food services all have the same basic problems, DRGs, cost containment, employee motivation, and many more. We take our responsibility at Presbyterian Intercommunity Hospital very seriously. We are committed to cost containment while providing a quality product and excellent services to our customers. We are excited about the changes facing us today and look forward to the challenge they create. Thank you very much, Jay. Appreciate it. Our priority in the Foods and Nutrition Department is to offer quality foods and services to our patients and we've been improving by leaps and bounds in that area for years. Patient menus have been streamlined and upgraded. Patient tray systems have become more effective. And clinical dietitians have become much more professional and sophisticated. But to be successful in the future, we'll not only have to do well with patient feeding, but we'll need to do well in our cafeterias. In order to do well in our cafeterias, the dietary management team and the dietary employees will need to make that attitude adjustment. We'll need to make a commitment to offer quality foods and services. We'll need to emphasize the positive and avoid stinking thinking. We'll need to communicate more effectively from the director clear down to the dishwasher. Management team members will need to lead by example. Everyone will need to get back to basics and pay attention to details. We'll need to give our customers what they want. Their list of demands is extensive but it's no more than what successful restaurants have been serving for years. People get excited about successful restaurants in anticipation of enjoying quality food. If your cafeteria food is not exciting, then you need to make some changes. Our challenge is especially difficult because traditionally, dietitians have not been trained in the art of cooking. Successful restaurants usually have executive chefs running the show. Dietitians are not executive chefs but they must realize that they are still responsible for producing the quality food. We are entering the exciting and opportune age of the entrepreneur. If you move swiftly and strategically with the right stuff, your department can become one of the superstar departments of your hospital. The anatomy of a dietary department shows many separate and distinct areas and subjects which all must be addressed at some point in order to build a cost-effective dietary department. But quality food and quality service are the secrets to success, and rightly so. After all, what could be more important than food and service in the food service business? The preceding program has been a presentation of the Hospital Satellite Network.